Good afternoon, friends. Um, so glad to have uh, so many people joining us this morning. My name is Greg Reedman. I am president of the Charles River Chamber, and today we're delighted to bring to you uh, a conversation with the two candidates running for the 11th Middlesex District seat, which covers uh, about half a Newton um, seat currently held by State Representative Kate Khan, who is retiring at the end of this year. Um, this, uh, the two candidates you'll meet today are in the primary contest for the Democratic nomination on September 3rd. They will face Republican Vlad Vanosky on in November in the general election, and we will invite uh, the two candidates in a runoff to a debate later this fall. But today, uh, please meet um, Alexander Jablon, who is a principal finance and operations auditor at RTX and has lived uh, in the 11th Middlesex District for 23 years. Alex, nice to meet you. Thanks for having me. Great, thanks. And uh, Amy Sangiolo, uh, who many of you know from, from having been involved as a city councilor and candidate for mayor, she's currently working at the Attorney General's office as a supervising consumer specialist. Uh, she's, as I mentioned, a two-time candidate for mayor and has been here for 20 years. Amy, it's a pleasure to see you again. Thank you. Great. So I want to I want to dig right in. For actually, first, let me just for the audience' sake, this will be a one-hour debate. There will be no opening statement, uh, but each candidate will have 90 seconds timed at the end for a closing statement. Other than the closing statement, we will not be using the timer. But I ask each of the candidates to be respectful of the other candidates and our viewers. Uh, keep your answers concise. Focus on the question asked. I reserve the right to interrupt, and probably will. Uh, in the interest of time or to follow up in a comment or just to make sure we get to other things and to be fair to the other candidate. Um, I did let the candidates know that the last question of the day will be, um, I told them that in advance, that question is, tell us the name of one person currently alive or deceased that you would like to invite to your home for dinner. Um, tell us what you would serve that reflects a tradition in your family and what you'd wanna talk about. So we'll get to that at the end. So anyway, let's dig right into it. I feel like you need to start with the crisis that's unfolding right at this very hour on Beacon Hill. Uh, it, the legislative session ends at midnight and there are still nine major bills, including a major housing bill and a major economic development bill that are stuck in conference committees. No one knows what's gonna come out of it. No one knows what's in there. Um, and meanwhile, the speaker and the Senate are sniping at each other and a bunch of other bills. It's, it's not a great environment there. But what it does mean is if you were now uh, on in Beacon Hill and you weren't part of those committees, you're gonna be asked to vote on these bills, presumably between now and midnight, um, before you read them. You won't have a chance to really know what's ultimately in those bills. So my question is, and I'll start with you, Amy Sangiolo, why do you wanna work in a place that operates like that? Well, I um, thank you for asking that question. It is very frustrating to see what's happening um, at the last 24 hours that we have before the legislative session ends. Um, I want to go in there because I believe that I have the experience and working with a large body of folks um, dealing with some really tough issues. Now, we are the city council was much more transparent, I think, than um, what we have um, at the state house. Um, but whatever I can do to um, help facilitate more transparency and um, more openness, um, I definitely would like to, to do that. Okay. Uh, same question for you, Alex. Yeah, so why do I want to be a part of the process? Uh, definitely definitely a great question. Um, I think probably most people on this call know that uh, if I was in it for anything like money or power, that this is the wrong job to apply for. Um, ultimately, I want to be on Beacon Hill because I want to help as many people as possible. And I think that this is the perfect forum for it. Um, you know, obviously, I grew up in Newton, went K through 12 here. I uh, spent most of my life in Massachusetts, minus six years. I'm very passionate about this state. I have so much love for this city that gave me everything, and I want to be able to give back to it. Um, we need a person that's going to go the extra mile, um, and I think that I'm the person that's going to be able to do that. You know, With a finance background, with the oversight background, I think that I'm able to, to bring those skills there. Okay. Um, so let, as, let, me, let me just, but exactly to the point of this question, you know, you're going to ask to vote on bills you don't know. How do you feel? About, why why are, you, are you willing to do that? And I and then I'll come back to you, Amy, and ask the same thing. 
you know, knowing that if you go against the grain, if you were out there speaking against leadership right now, you'd be punished and you'd never get on a good committee or a good assignment because that is the way it works on Beacon Hill. Yeah, Greg, well, I'd love to answer that one. So when it to answer your question in terms of um, you know, not knowing the contents of the bill, no, I'm not comfortable with that. And if you want to vote for a rubber stamp or someone that's going to get strong armed into doing things, then you are voting for the wrong candidate if you're voting for me. Um, I'm an auditor. Rubber stamping is the exact type of thing that got us into things like Enron, Arthur Anderson, Tyco. Worldcom, et cetera. Um, if you want to use a more government example, that's what got us into the Puerto Rican debt crisis by signing off on bills at the last minute, not knowing their contents um, and things like that. So uh, if I'm briefed by the conference committee beforehand, if I have reasonable assurance, sure, that's fine. Um, as for the point that you made about getting taken off committees, I would like to bring a very relevant example here. KCON, Ruth Balzer, going up, let's go back to the early 2000s here. They went up against Speaker Finneran. They very had a very famous fight there. He tried to draw them into the same district. Didn't end up working out after pressure from outside groups. There was, you know, talking about taking them off committees. I know Ruth ultimately did get taken off of one committee. But in the end, both of them ended up becoming chairs. Uh, Ruth for a chair for a division and um, Kay for a committee. Um, both of them are retiring on their own accord. Finnerin ended up going to prison. So I would say that ultimately people that stand up for the people of the 11th district end up, you know, in a pretty good position and people that strong arm tend to end up in pretty bad positions. Okay, so so well, I'm gonna, I'll go to Amy with that basic same question, but I, I think Amy remembers uh, David Cohn, who was a state representative, basically got pushed out of Beacon Hill, ended up running for mayor because he couldn't, uh, didn't, didn't want to go along with the grain in Beacon Hill. It ended his, his route there. Right. But then he became mayor of uh, Newton. So, um, you know, things worked out for him at the at the end of the day. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think it's very troubling to get last minute um, amendments to bills or last minute bills put in um, at the end of a session. Um, I strived when I was on the city council to make sure that I knew everything that was going on. I think uh, at, to some extent, anybody who's at the state legislature should know what bills are up there what is being discussed we might not know what's happening behind the committee uh, in the in the conference committees and all the little um, last minute deals that are being made but at the end of the day we have a basic understanding of what needs to get done and how that needs to get done and to the maximum extent possible i will read every single bill and try to understand all the last minute issues that are and bills um, and trade-offs that are being made made um, in order to get the work done. Okay, thank you. And Amy, so since you mentioned uh, Mayor Cohn ultimately becoming mayor from the state rep and that worked out pretty good, you've run for mayor twice and you're running for this job now. Which job do you really want? Uh, I actually think that this is the better fit for me, um, just given my experience in the legislature and the, on the local level, and also given my state experience working at the state attorney general's office. That really was an eye-opening experience, particularly in housing. Um, because I deal um, directly with individuals and families who are facing eviction and foreclosure. So to see a different segment of our population um, and see the struggles that they have was has been really eye-opening. I've been working with eight different state agencies and different nonprofit and for-profit organizations that provide services, um, you know, try to provide that wraparound service to keep people housed. And I see the sort of the disconnect and, and part of the drive for me to run for this office is to get the state agents and the local nonprofits to work together collaboratively to make sure, not just with housing, but with any issue, any social service issue, we really need that kind of coordination um, throughout the state. So Alex, let me ask you a question about that. So uh, Amy Sangelo has a couple decades of experience in the city council and no legislative experience. You've never run for elected office before knowing how complicated things can be in Beacon Hill, why would we not want someone with that kind of experience instead of someone brand new to it? Yeah, hey, it's it's a valid question. And I think that it's it, it's one that needs to be asked, right? So anyone that's my age, you, you know, is going to be met with a degree of skepticism. So I'll bring forth a few points. Yes, I in terms of government experience, yes, I have served on the Financial Audit Advisory Committee for the city for the uh, for over a year now. Was appointed by former President Albright. But in terms of actual elected office, yes, I, I have not held it before. 
Um, what I do bring to the table is other experience. Uh, so I bring that financial experience to the table, something that I think we desperately need, the oversight experience as well as the budget management experience. I would also like to highlight that Kay also did not have any elected experience before she came into the legislature. And she was able to bring things like, as a psychiatric nurse, she was able to bring that experience to the table. It was able to do things like bring forth mental health legislation at a time that it was highly stigmatized. Um, I also, of course, am in a different field, but I'm able to bring that area of expertise. I'm, of course, not knocking my opponent in any way for serving 20 years very admir admirably on the Board of Aldermen slash City Council. Um, but, you know, we do bring different experience sets to the table. Um, what I would um, what I'd say, uh, you know, in addition to that is, hey, you know, both of us have served zero years in the state legislature. We would both be coming in the freshman class. It is a different ball game. Absolute, absolutely, there are similarities. But of course, it is a completely different position. And, and just a quick follow-up, why, why not run for city council first, Alex? Yeah, I'll bring it back to one of my first answers. Um, I want to help as many people as possible. I see this as an area where I can do that. Um, I uh, really like and respect people that are representing my ward currently in the city council um, and think that they are doing a good job. Um, obviously, part of this is timing. Uh, if Kay was running again, I would not be running against her. I think she's done a great job representing the district for the past 29 years. Um, so yeah, I you know I transparency is a big part of my campaign. Definitely part of it is timing, but I think the biggest part of it is, is the role that I have been looking after for quite a while. Um, and I think it's the area that I can have the most impact as an individual on the city and the Commonwealth that I love and help with. Great. Okay, so Amy, let me ask a sort of different version of that same question. So there's a lot of talk in the Democratic Party about the need for generational change and generational leadership. And nationally, we're all excited about the prospect of generational change in the Democratic Party. Why should voters not choose generational change and elect Alex, uh, somebody who could really be there long enough to actually work his way up on committees, knowing how long it takes to, to work your way through Beacon Hill? So I just want to say that I have a wide breadth of, of support um, throughout the community, basically because of the work that I've done over the, I'd say, 30 plus years of living here in Newton. Not only did I serve on the city council for 20 years, I work at the state um, at the attorney general's office, but I've been in involved with nonprofit and for-profit organizations throughout the city who serve different programmatic functions throughout the city, right? Whether it's kids, whether it's PTO organizations, youth athletic organizations, environmental organizations, um, uh, uh, immigrant organizations. I've got that wide breadth of experience. I've reached out to youth. I have kids working on my campaign, not just to go and canvas, but to also learn about policy and inform me and educate me about what they'd like to see. So I think that's what um, I bring to the table. Yeah, and I, me, think, me, um, I think you're not quite getting the question, though. So is, you know, why should we not be at this moment in time, since given how rarely these jobs turn over, be thinking it's time for, we could say, Amy Sangelo is an amazing person, has done a great person, good track record, but it's time for younger people to start taking leadership in this uh, country, in the state. Why should voters not make that part of their consideration when they, how they vote? Because I think the challenges that we're facing are very critical and that I think a great deal of knowledge and experience leading and succeeding in these areas, whether it's environment, whether it's the housing crisis, whether it's, um, uh, funding our public transit system, whether it's funding and fighting for more dollars for our schools, I think that's what's important. Someone with experience is needed at the state house in order to move these bold propo proposals forward. Okay, let's move on to some actual issues. And I know you both have spoken a lot about um, in the environment and climate being a top priority for you. Um, and I think we all understand that the gravity and the emergency of the situation facing our environment. Um, we know we need to wean off fossil fuels, but we also know many business and property owners are worried that if we move too fast, the grid won't be ready for the if, uh, with the electrification electricity we need. And also the cost of electrification is going to drive up rents, uh, including housing, but any kind of rents in general. How would you balance the need to move too fast uh, with the need to make sure we're not putting unobtainable restrictions on small business owners? and making sure the grid is there to supply. And we'll start with you, Alex, on this one. Yeah, um, so I think, you know, as with any of these things, it comes down to how we how we structure the the, the laws and the regulations that, that are being put forth. 
We have to make sure that we're not only, you know, saying, hey, you got to go and do this. We have to provide the resources for that transition um, and be able to be there and working hand in hand with people at the chamber, with small business owners to make sure that it's, uh, you know, not too onerous. At the same time, yes, there is a big cost, um, you know, associated with electrification. But you know what's a bigger cost um, is if we don't do it and then we start having our water lines come up and take away our shoreline here in, in Boston, um, you know, and then you don't have any space whatsoever. Uh, so there is a much bigger cost to doing nothing uh, than there is to doing something. Uh, so I think that, yes, it, it does have to be done collaboratively, but at the same time, this is a pressing issue. Um, I mean, anyone that's gone outside during this summer knows that the climate crisis is at our doorstep. Um, we need the time for action was 20 years ago, but we got now um, and we're doing that in the state legislature. And if elected, I would continue to do that and work in hand in hand, in hand with small businesses um, as you know, uh, I uh, try to do as much as possible and be collaborative in my roles in my career. So, Amy, same question to you. Did we just say, sorry, business owners, sorry, uh, builders, uh, we just need to do this and it's more important than than what happens? No, I don't think we say sorry. I think I think absolutely we need to uh, partner with our businesses um, so that they can move forward. I, you know, it's an ex existential crisis, right, that we're facing. So we all have to put in whatever we can to save our planet. So what can we do? I mean, I testified at that hearing for, um, I think it was last month on Birdo, right? And I heard what business owners, your chamber members have said, and I took that to heart. There are gonna be costs involved. Um, and, and whatever I can do at the state house to provide um, additional, um, not just incentive programs, but to help alleviate the cost burden that I know I absolutely do hear the businesses and, and the costs that they're going to have to, um, um, uh, put out in order to comply with these um, mandatory um, reductions in their fossil fuel use, but it's got to be done. We've already we have this mandate of getting to by 2050 to get off of fossil fuels or to at least reduce our fossil fuels to a point where we have a fighting chance to save our planet. So how can we get there? I think at least with the um, the Berto ordinance, there are um, protections built in to at least try to um, recognize the hardship. Right. Um, put off having to um, actually upgrade your systems immediately. And it's and it's a, pro a process. We know we all have to get there, how we get there and how the state can partner and the federal government, I I'd like to add, to partner with everyone to get to and meet our climate action goals is going to be something that I plan on doing. Thank you, Alex. I can follow up of sort. Uh, I don't know if the Birdo pro proposal currently before the city council does not it requires uh, changes to be made on commercial property owners uh, and but not residential owners. Should there be some component that is making residential owners and particularly single family residential owners uh, responsible for reducing their energy use, mandating it as opposed to just hoping they will? Yeah, I mean, I I, I think that uh, definitely the commercial side, I think is the the most the most pressing issue definitely you know contributes the most to to emissions. Um, I also do just very, very quickly want to add on uh, beforehand uh, to my last answer. Just wanted to say that absolutely we should not move forward if there's not a plan in place uh, that would just wreck kind of havoc and chaos. Um, forgot to say that before. My apologies. Um, but yes, I, I think it's something that we can definitely you know look at uh, in the future. I think that commercial is definitely the first step that we have to take um, while uh, you know replacing the systems. Um, certainly, we can we can look at residential. I will say it's something I like to look further into, full transparency. Um, there's something I'm not as well versed on right now on the uh, more on the residential side. I've been looking more on the commercial side. So something that I'm continuing to look into and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll definitely provide, provide so, and more Amy, Do you agree with that, that there, there, there should not be a program right now requiring mandating residential owners to also reduce their energy use? No, I think residential owners do. Um, I uh, supported the um, large uh, residential apartment uh, owners, multifamily uh, owners, I did not support and do not support going to single family homes yet or smaller, you know, uh, below four family units yet. I think we have to um, take a look at that. I think eventually people are going to get off of fossil fuels um, if we can convince the gas companies not to expand their lines um, and replace their lines um, uh, instead of repairing the gas leaks. 
Great. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's move on to housing, which is the chamber's uh, number one top economic priority. And I know you've both spoken about it being a priority for you too. So as I mentioned earlier, we hope that the House and the Senate will agree on this housing bond bill that's before them if it before it dies, a chance to move forward at midnight tonight. But and there's a lot of good things in that bill, and I know you've both spoken and familiar with it. Do you have any ideas that, of things the state could do to increase our housing stock that are not part of that bill? Well, the, any new oh, housing sorry, ideas? Amy, we'll go with you this time. <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to jump like that. Um, so I believe housing is a human right, and in order to do that, we have to do everything we can um, to uh, not only increase supply, but also be intentional about creating truly affordable housing and housing that is accessible for all. Um, we need to make sure that it's habitable. We need to make sure that um, uh, that, um, that that rents are controlled. We need to make sure that um, people have the opportunities throughout the Commonwealth to have access to housing. So I, I think the bond bill is great, but what's missing is the real estate transfer tax. I think having that as an option for municipalities to um, opt into is a good solution. The, the uh, municipalities don't have to do it, but it's an option that they can. And I think that that can help in terms of having funding to not only um, provide and uh, increase our supply of affordable housing and, and by creation, but also to preserve our affordable housing stock. What um, Governor Healy has put forward is a, a great first start, but we need more. I, if any, if we can do anything else, I would like to see more of a public sector, more government funded um, creating um, housing stock. Um, which I, I, I was a proponent of when I was on the city council. I was hoping that the Affordable Housing Trust Fund could help jumpstart that so that the city could go and um, purchase and acquire properties and bring those into their housing inventory. Alex, same question. Do you have any new ideas related to growing housing across the state? Yeah, yeah. Let's, we'll, we'll, we'll talk new ideas. So I think there's a, there's a couple of things there, right? So I, you know, uh, Councilor Sanjoa did talk about transfer fees. I know that's something that, um, you know, we've talked about in the past, something that I was disappointed, especially it's in our state democratic platform. It's something that the governor proposed and the House and Senate stripped it out. Not not a great look in, in, in my eyes. And I also saw it as the perfect time really to implement it with the the recent settlement that we had with the, uh, the National Realtors Association dropping the standard commission. Uh, as for other things, Things that I would like to look into, definitely um, repurposing underused property, uh, such as, you know, we are going through a bit of a revolution right now with malls back in the 80s, big deal. Uh, right now, not doing so hot for the most part. Um, I think using some of those old, old properties, you know, we saw what happened with the with the Arsenal Mall and how we've been able to repurpose that into office space, into the Lifetime Fitness um, and the uh, or Atrium Mall. Um, and then Arsenal obviously was was redone. That's Watertown, my bad. Um, so things like that, mills, uh, things like that. I mean, they're they're really big properties. If they're not being used, then I really think that they're just perfect opportunities to make that into uh, additional housing. Some other things that I would like to look at. Um, two things that I've seen as big issues in the housing sector as of late. Number one, the role of private equity. Um, we've seen BlackRock become like the biggest landlord in the country and they haven't been a very good one. Um, I am very hesitant uh, just as someone that's a finance person generally to put, you know, kind of protectionist restrictions against private equity, but it seems that this has gotten to a point it's out of control. Um, they are buying up all of our housing and are basically exploiting people and jacking up rents and, you know, not providing maintenance. It's a big issue. It's something that I would like to look at further. In addition, the just explosion of people that are buying up property as Airbnbs, continuing to lease them out. I love Airbnb. I much prefer them over hotels. However, people, you know, when it was started, it was really meant to, hey, you know, I only, you know, I snowbird down in Arizona or something like that. You know, while I'm not there, it'd be great to be able to use that to pay my property taxes, something like that. People are now buying 20, 30 houses, or at least, you know, two, three, four, five, and exclusively using them for Airbnb as opposed to living in them. Um, we are in a housing crisis. If we were in a place where houses were a dime a dozen, that would be fine. However, 
it's very clear that this is uh, this has become an issue, and I would like to look. Okay, so I, 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 Amy, I'll let you follow up on that in a minute, but I do want to ask Alex one thing. All right, so Amy said she would support giving communities rent control, allowing allowing rent control communities to adopt rent control. Do you, do you like that? Do you favor that idea? Um, my blanket answer is no. I think rates rent stabilization. I am in support of rent control. No. We have seen how inefficient this creates a housing market. Um, you know, if you look at places like New York, people that should be downsizing do not because of rent control. Um, it just creates inefficient markets. There's been plenty of studies that have shown it. Um, I think that it's a it's a short term. It's really looking at something as a patch as opposed to replacing the pipe. Um, I don't support as a whole against stabilization efforts. I absolutely support. I think that we've really seen just a uh, exploitation of renters in the past couple of years. Um, but rent control as a whole, no, I do not. Okay, thank you, uh, Amy. Why? Uh, you want to <laughs> you want to start with rent control? And I guess the question I would ask you about rent control is: Are you not concerned that you know, in Newton, for example? A lot of the naturally affordable rental apartments are owned by small private owners. And if you put mm -hmm. rent control in there, they may end up selling those properties off, be forced to sell them off to those larger corporations and, and take it away from that small family. Right. So, I, so, so my proposal is not to mandate rent control throughout the Commonwealth. My proposal is to allow communities mm -hmm. to opt into rent control. Let the communities decide whether that's something that is something that they should be doing or not. That, you know, the folks that I work with, you know, Alex was talking about private equity firms buying up these properties. Yes, they are. They're either letting the properties um, decline, um, not taking care of them, or they're jacking up the rents because there is no control over the rents. Even the light tech properties, we're seeing that the rents are, the people that are living in these um, so-called affordable housing uh, developments are seeing their rents go up because it's based on area median income. So a lot of the folks that are living in there will see that their, their housing costs burden. They're paying more than 30% um, to rent, to housing. Um, so, so I think there's a lot that needs to be done, right? We have to like lean on uh, property management companies and these landlords to make sure that they provide safe and habitable housing. We have to make sure that if we're going to create more, um, particularly rental housing units, that they're uh, accessible so that um, folks who are disabled or who have other needs have the ability to get there. I think we need to be intentional about creating more truly affordable housing. We're seeing the the issue with the with the right to shelter, right? And we're seeing that a lot of folks who are being forced out of their homes or even new arrivals to our state not having any type of temporary shelter or even housing to move into once the once the temporary nature of their um issue um has has um been been resolved right so if we don't solve that problem which is a nationwide problem we're going to have a, a an even bigger crisis on our hands so again, I go back to government needs to intervene. This is a huge problem throughout the throughout the um, the nation as well as the state, and we need federal dollars and we need state dollars to go and invest in building and acquiring property so that we can go and um, create the housing that we need at all levels, but particularly uh, affordable, uh, um, truly affordable um, housing. So let me ask you this: Would you support? more state, giving the state uh, more authority over telling communities that they need to change their zoning laws to allow for multifamily homes on single family lots. Would you want the state to have that power to, to order communities to do that? I don't know that I would like to order communities, but I would like to certainly um, increase our carrots that we um, provide communities. I think we're doing that with the 40R program. We're increasing, or maybe it's the 40S program, but we're increasing more um, grants opportunities um, and funding to districts to adopt into programs that we've created. I'd like to see us create more uh, opportunities for different over types of overlay districts if we can um, with carrots um, to in encourage uh, communities to um, um, participate and loosen up some of their zoning if, if, right. if that's what's needed. Alex, same question to you. Should should the state mandate that uh, communities uh, change multi change single family lots to multifamily under some scenario? Not a big fan of mandates, and I'll tell you why, Greg. Um, I also am more on the side of incentives. I think that mandates typically, what we see is incentivized building only up to that minimum threshold. Um, I am much more in favor of increasing incentives for both developers as well as for municipalities. 
uh, developers for creating uh, affordable housing uh, opportunities and municipalities for changing their zoning to more inclusionary zoning. Um, I think that it's far more effective. Um, I think that we've seen some really great progress in some places that that have passed zoning like that, places like Cambridge um, and their uh, affordable housing overlay. So I would definitely much more like to see uh, us focus on the on the incentive side. You know, I, I think that it's something that, would you know, if we're not making the progress we have to, it's something that we might have to look at in the future. Um, and that's something that I'm open to relooking at in the future. As of right now, I think that I would much more like to look at the incentive structure here. Okay, let me um, ask you one more question about housing and then we'll move on to some other stuff. So yep. there, some a lot of developers will say, especially developers who build multifamily housing, that if the state simply changed the uh, 40B threshold from the current 10%, to 15%, we would solve our housing shortage in this commonwealth because every community would be building more housing and would include more affordable housing, more units in general. Amy, is that a good idea or not, raising it from 10 to 15%? I don't believe in um, raising that from 10% to 15%. I don't think moving the goalposts is the right answer. I have all sorts of problems with 40B, but I have to acknowledge and recognize 40B is the only game in town that has created affordable housing and a great deal of affordable housing. I acknowledge that. But at the same time, I think what we should do if we're gonna reform 40B is to increase the percentage in those um, developments from uh, what, it, what it is now from 25% to 30% or even higher and have a mix of incomes and include below 50% as a, a definite or even below 30% AMI so that we have truly mixed income housing throughout the state. So a lot of developers will say you raise that number too much and your the projects don't pencil out anymore and they don't. And get come to the state and come to the state and we'll help you pencil it out because I'm all for subsidizing developers and giving them the funding that they need in order to make it work. All right, Alex, what do you think about that? Um, so I I agree with the number of the pro proposals there. I mean, I think that. The ultimately, I think that just tinkering with the formula, it's it, you know is not kind of the the way that we're going to get to the end goal that we that we need to um absolutely i mean you know i i think that looking at things like like the like the ami and and the percentage of affordable units uh you know per development i think are absolutely something we should look at but you know at the end of the day it's um you know it needs to be just one of the approaches that we have um and i think that you know there's a, a number of other proposals now in the bond bill uh, for building more affordable housing. I think that, you know, uh, again, just tinkering with the formula itself uh, is not going to get us to where we need to go. Okay. So let me let me move move on another topic. Uh, our small businesses, and I'm particularly thinking of the mom and pop retailers and restaurants and other shops in our village centers. Do either of you have any idea of any kind of state program you would advocate for that could help those smallest businesses? Uh, Amy, so I'll let you go first. So I, I think we have to make sure that if we're going to uh, build a really strong and competitive economy for the state as well as the city, we have to really focus on our small businesses. They are struggling. They're struggling because of regulations that we uh, impose on them. You know, as you mentioned earlier, you know things like electrification and environmental regulations. We have to make sure that we partner with them to make sure that it's easier for them in order to comply. Um, we have to make sure that infrastructure is available for them, whether it's parking, whether it's um, access to you know the, the their water systems or their sewer systems. We need to make sure that we do that. I think it's important that we um, support them not only by creating a, a, you know some density in our village center areas. I think we definitely need to do that, right? Um, but uh, so that they have um, uh, the sort of customers that they need. But we also have to make sure that um, we create sort of that um, hive. And I, I call it a hive because what I'm envisioning is uh, either a system, centralized system through the state um, that can also be used by uh, different towns and municipalities that have the resources that everyone needs, Streamline of, streamlining the permitting process, making sure that the businesses understand uh, what new regulations have been um, uh, approved and that they have to comply with, making sure that they have um, either legal access to legal counsel, because sometimes if they need that in order to get licenses and permits, we have to make sure that um, they also are aware, particularly new and emerging businesses have access to um, right. 
knowing what um, real estate may be available. I think Cambridge has a wonderful model. I think they work with an organization called CoStar. So they're able to put online um, some of the more recent um, available real estate so that they know what's available and they work with the city in order to find out you know, what, what their business needs are and try to match them up with what's available. I think hey, those Alex, are good programs. Alex, hey, your, your ideas for helping small businesses? Yeah. Hey, I come from a, a family of small business owners. One of them is on the line right now. Um, uh, you know, my mom has her own law practice. My dad, psychologist, has his own practice. I had my own small business in high school selling sneakers. My grandparents as well. So I, you know, I come from a line of small business owners um, and I definitely understand some of some of the, the struggles. I think on the campaign trail, I've talked, uh, you know, even with my across the street neighbor talking about how regulations have forced him uh, to lay off lay off workers that he has and basically do everything himself in in his home inspection business and in construction so, so any ideas yes yes um so some things that i like to look at um i think having a more robust uh kind of micro loan system uh i think we've seen in the past when that's been implemented and implemented in other places um has been really good for small businesses especially ones that have short-term struggles know that they have a big you know revenue streak coming or or just starting out um i think it, it, you know, a lot of these things tie back into public transportation and housing. Um, using mixed use development, I think, you know, look at look at Newtonville, look at the Austin Street, you know, having like Cafe Nero and things there and all the benches that have just been put in by people. Newtonville is buzzing. I grew up in Newtonville and it's buzzing in ways that I haven't seen when I was a kid. People are there all the time. It's great. So having more mixed use, um, uh, public transportation, really having, uh, you know, increasing the reliability of the T, restoring that trust in the T so that people, when they're coming in on the T, boom, you come out, uh, you know, something like a Newton Center stop, you have, um, uh, you know, uh, we have a number of restaurants that just closed around there, um, being able to uh, have that traffic from the T back in uh, so that we, we have those businesses um, uh, thriving again, uh, simplifying the permitting process, definitely. Um, I'm a big fan of of eating outside, maybe not when it's 98 degrees out. Um, but I think that, you know, we saw some encouraging things during COVID that we've been able to make things easier for like dining outside, carry out of alcoholic uh, beverages, things like that. Um, just being able to ease the burden. I am pro-regulation, even though I'm in finance. I know sometimes, uh, you know, people think that kind of goes head in head. Um, but I think that we need to look at regulations and see what makes sense and what doesn't. So let me let me ask you a kind of follow up there on the ballot in November, and we'll get back to you, Amy. On the ballot in November, um, there's a question that would raise the tipped wage, which is basically the wage that we pay wait staffs in restaurants and some other places, to the minimum wage and, and reshare the tips. Do you support uh, that change into the, uh, or the payment system for uh, restaurant workers? Uh, yeah, if you look in the documentation, I was one of the signatories uh, to that petition to put that on the ballot. Um, so I think, yes, one of the big things that we've seen is uh, problems with wage theft and things of that nature. Um, I do want to also not like when we talk about the minimum wage, uh, obviously, we want to look at like inflationary pressures, things like that. You know, I get a raise every year. People that are working these jobs should as well. Um, and obviously a little different when we're talking about tip wage. But I also want to make sure this is not the only approach that we're taking, um, because when we're talking about things like minimum wage, we're often talking about the cost of living. So we have to be able to tackle that part of the problem, housing, transportation, et cetera, um, in addition to doing things like raising minimum wage, like um, the, the tip wage question. So okay. Amy, I'm going to yes. the, I'm ask you about the tip wage, but I know you wanted to go to somewhere else too. So maybe answer the tip wage question first. And I'll just say sure. a lot of restaurant owners feel it's going to put them out of business. So how do you right. feel about the ballot question? No, I, I feel for the restaurant um, owners, but um, just from my work at the AG's office, I see a lot of complaints come in about um, wage theft. So I, I do think um, that we do need to um, support this, um, this ballot initiative. Okay. Um, you, but, wanted to go on to, you wanted to follow back on yeah, something? Yeah, so I just wanted to go back to, you know, helping small businesses. And I want to just like focus on Newton because I think Newton has a tremendous opportunity to create an arts and culture district. You know, we know that arts and culture is an economic driver for the state. Um, I think it comprises like 4% of our um, of our revenue um, that we've received from the um 
from just um, just revenue in general. Um, and I, I, I really think that if we do more support for um, our arts and culture um, organizations, I think that helps drive people to come to Newton. And I think it certainly helps our businesses when we have more people come to Newton. Um, I, I think that's something that we definitely need to invest in. Um, I also think that we, you know, we can expand on our um, in our economic development program, even here in Newton. We've got a great guy, um, John Sisson is doing his best, but I think more resources need to go um, with him or to him so that he can expand the programs that he's already launching, going out to businesses, finding out what, uh, what businesses need. And, you know, Lauren Berman has got a small business owner, has all over Newton, and she's creating these activities to drive people to these businesses. And I wish the city and the state could help um, do more of that. Great, thank you. Alex, you wanna comment on that at all or should I move on to that? I do. Uh, in Newton, we're the home of where the Swiffer was invented, where the Reebok pump was invented. And in recent years, we have seen these businesses outgrow Newton. Uh, you know, things like iRobot, TripAdvisor, et cetera, have moved out of here. I'd like to be able to see us, um, you know, invest, um, do things like, you know, tax breaks um, and, and, and grants, things like that, in order to incentivize businesses to stay. I know, obviously, Newton, Newton is not Watertown. It's not Needham. I know we do have some space constraints, but I would really like to be able to incentivize uh, businesses to stay here as they grow bigger. Um, and also attract new businesses uh, to stay here. Um, in terms of uh, arts and culture district, it sounds great. I haven't looked into it, um, but uh, I could comment further in the future. Amy, I'm wondering if you maybe uh, your thoughts on that uh, from a perspective of what you might be able to do on Beacon Hill. So TripAdvisor moves from Newton to Needham, NBC10 moves from Newton to Needham, uh, Shark Ninja moves from Newton to Needham, and other companies have you know sprung up all around us. What can Beacon Hill do? What could you as a state rep do? No, I think that the tax incentive, uh, uh, looking at the tax breaks and, and what we can do for those businesses to incentivize them to stay. I think, um, was it Representative Garlic um, who might have um, led the effort um, in um, Needham um, to do that and to encourage them and that's why we lost them. So whatever we can do um, on that front, I would be happy to work with our business okay. community uh, and work with our city. Thank you. I will move on. I want to ask another ballot question, which is the question regarding MCAS, or more specifically, the question would eliminate a standardized testing as a graduation requirement uh, for all Massachusetts students. Uh, we would be one of only three states that don't have any kind of standardized graduation requirement. Alex, you're the guy who probably of the three of us who actually took the MCAS exam. So I'll go to you first. Is it, does that make sense to you? Do you support that initiative to eliminate any standardized testing? Yes, I do. Um, I'll say a few reasons why. So, yes, I, I did take the MCAS, uh, you know, third grade through 10th grade. Um, unlike some people, I actually liked it because it meant no homework or anything like that. And I generally did quite well on it, which is why I think this is a non-biased answer. Um, I don't think it's good for students or teachers. Um, we have seen it kind of lead to narrowly taught curricula. Um, we have students that struggle. Yes, you can retake it. There are students that just struggle with standardized tests. That doesn't mean we have to get rid of the MCAS, though. It is talking about eliminating it as a graduation requirement. So whether it be the MCAS, whether it be a replacement, I think it's good to still have something where we can compare school districts, see progress, things like that. But at the same time, I see no reason it should be a graduation requirement. And if the teachers are saying it, I'm someone that listens to experts. I'm not a master of everything. Uh, no one is. Um, and I think that we should listen to the experts here who are on the ground and are saying this should be eliminated. I listen to them, um, not to not to anyone else. Um, and I think that it is a good idea to eliminate it as a graduation requirement, specifically, not scrap it all together. Amy? No, I don't think it's a good idea to eliminate the MCAS requirement. I think we do need some standard uh, standardization. We want to make sure that our businesses know that um, when uh, we have graduates coming out of our school system, that they have at least the 10th grade um, you know, educational level uh, that they comply with. Um, I, I'm not a fan of standardized tests. I gotta tell you, I'm not good at standardized tests, right? And I certainly didn't like um, when some teachers were teaching to the test, right? I think, you know, you wanna make sure that everybody gets a broad education, but there's no alternative that's being proposed now. And I think that's, that's, that's where, um, that's the issue, right? There's no proposal. And if we eliminate it as a graduation requirement, we have no requirement at all, right? No standard at all. And that's why I'm not in favor of it. 
Thank but you. you, I mean, you you can as a business owner, who has ever asked for an MCAS requirement? Like, like who's ever asked for my transcripts? No one on an MCAS. I mean, you're still graduating high school. You still have your diploma. You still have your transcripts of four years worth of high school service. Um, and it doesn't mean that you again that it's just eliminating it as a graduation requirement. Um, you can we can still have the MCAS, not have it be a graduation requirement. Uh, so again, I, I disagree with my opponent here. Amy, you want to follow up? No, I mean, Alex mentioned, uh, you know, listening to the experts, and I listened to what Jeff Riley, a former Secretary of Department of Education, I mean, he's against it. I, you know, listened to Maura Healy, Governor Maura, Maura Healy, who's um, also against uh, eliminating the requirement. And I think the Chamber also came out recently against eliminating the requirement, right? I think there are a lot of educational experts that think we do need some type of a graduation requirement. And unless there's an alternative that's being proposed, I don't think we should eliminate it. And I, I just, I have to say, Alex, that employers don't have to ask for your MCAS scores because they know you graduated. If you graduated, you have qualified for the test. So you don't, you know, you have that assurance that, that everybody you hire has some English science and math skills. But we're going to move on. Um, one last question on the ballot really quickly. Uh, there's a ballot question allowing the legislator to, to be audited. Amy, yes or no? So I signed the petition. So yes, although I don't know whether she actually has the constitutional authority to do it, um, I did sign the petition. Okay, Alex, yes or no, and uh, allowing the legislature to be audited. Yes, but I have serious reservations. I am in support of the proposal as a whole. Um, I think that it is very clear that um, that the the legislature is in need of that, and they have not been self regulating. For instance, the House of Representatives in Congress does have their own version of basically an inspector general. We don't really have that, in, and it's okay. clear that I'm something gonna, needs I'm going to ask you to stop there just because I'm watching the clock here now. So next okay. one, I want to uh, talk about transportation briefly. Uh, the MBTA is running towards a fiscal cliff. Uh, we all know how important transportation is. One idea of the many ideas that's been talked about out there would be to raise add tolling to other roads around Massachusetts. Right now, basically, you pay to go through the tunnels and the bridges and drive the Mass Pike. Um, the governor says tolling is off the table. Should it be off the table, Amy Sangiello? No, I don't think anything should be off the table. I think we have to look at all options. Um, I think Secretary Tibbetts um, had suggested that we take a look at tolling, and I think the um, board also recommended a whole uh, had a whole bunch of recommendations. So I think tolling is one of them, and and nothing should be off the table. Great, Alex. What do you think about tolling? Yeah, I think nothing nothing could be off the table. And, um, you know, we have to look at everything in totality. Okay. That. Either of you have any other new ideas or ideas you would strongly recommend to increase revenue for the MBTA or for transportation in general? Well, I think we're, we're going to get hopefully a lot more money from the fair share tax um, uh, going towards uh, public transit. I want to make sure that um, we spend our money wisely. I think with Philip Eng at the helm, we are making improvements. Slow, it feels slow, but I think we're making improvements. I didn't get a chance to get on the tee this morning um, to try out the new fare system. I, I can't wait to try that out um, and, and see how that works. Great. Alex, I think. Yeah, at the end of the day, I mean, public transportation, it's a, it's a public good. So, I mean, I, I agree. I think fair share, I do like that it was earmarked specifically for education and for transportation purposes. And money has to be good to put to good use. Um, you know, we we have repairs in, here in Newton that we need to do, make our access, our uh, commuter rail stations accessible, uh, something that's been worked on a long time by taking. All right. Thank you both for all that and, and for letting us get to a lot of different topics quickly. So uh, we're going to get your 90 second closing. But before we do that, the question I told you about in advance, tell us the name of any one person currently alive or deceased that you would invite to your home for dinner. Tell us what you would serve that reflects a tradition in your family and what you would want to discuss. Um, I can't remember where we started or where we left off, but I'll go with you, Alex, first on this one. Yeah, sounds good. Um, I think that I would probably choose uh, my, my grandmother, um, Betty Morrison. Uh, someone who I miss every single day, ask the questions I didn't get the chance to ask while she was alive. Um, I'll let her know how I'm doing. Uh, sorry, getting a little emotional. Um, just let her know how I'm doing. Um, and yeah, I that's that would be my answer. Family's everything to me. So what would you uh, serve, Alex? What would I serve? Uh, my dad makes this killer chicken kebab. 
Uh, I have made it with him many times. It's always like reserved for special occasions. But let me tell you, there's no leftovers. Whenever we made the kebabs, my mom, who's right there, Eileen Morrison, uh, yeah, you can see, giving the thumbs up uh, that, that that would be the case. Uh, so definitely. Very good. Amy Sangelo, same question for you. Now, I would also invite a family member, and I was torn between this, between my mother or my father. Um, so when my, I, I'm going to say Yuriko Ma, my mother, who was a Japanese immigrant who came to the United States. Um, when my father died, I learned that she was 10 years older, that she had been previously married, that she came over as a Japanese war bride, married to a African-American um, army sergeant, and I knew nothing about this. And after my father died, my mother had pretty bad dementia. I couldn't learn anything about her story. And I'm dying to learn about the story because I, I want to know what struggles or what wonderful uh, memories she had of that era. Uh, but she never shared that with me. I would serve sukiyaki because that was her favorite dish. And that's probably the only decent Japanese dish that I can make. Thank you. I, I will say, so it's always so interesting to hear these answers. And we've done now three of these debates with the three state rep races in the chamber footprint. So eight people, seven of you chose a family member, one chose uh, Jesus Christ, uh, the others, but we've had other times when I've asked this question and, and other historical figures have come up, but it's just interesting. So anyway, thank yeah, you so much. Yeah, initially I was going to say Paul Wellstone, but I, I think my grandmother far beats him out. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> so um, finally, uh, Closing statements, and we'll begin with Amy. Uh, you've got 90 seconds to tell us why we should consider voting for you on September 3rd. Sure. Thank you again for the opportunity to meet with you and your members. I always enjoy these forums, so thank you again. Um, I believe that I will be an effective advocate to move forward very bold proposals to address the many challenges that we face. I'm a former 20 year member of the city council. I worked at the AG's office in housing as a consumer advocate for the past three and a half years. I've got 30 plus years of experience, again, working with for-profit, non-profit community organizations that serve our some of our most vulnerable residents. Um, I've got deep experience in getting things done in the legislative process. I've not only led on issues, but I've also succeeded on issues. I've a proven track record of delivering excellent constituent service um, and working inclusively with stakeholders um, throughout um, the city and as, as well as the Commonwealth. And I pledge to be um, continue my good communication and transparency in government skills. Not only um, uh, did I do it in 2015 when I started my e-newsletter, but also I continued doing that in co-founding Fig City News. So I will be a partner as um, fierce as I was at City Hall, and I will be just as fierce at the State House. So I Thank hope you'll you. vote for me, Amy Moss Angelo. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Uh, uh, Alex, you get the final word. Good. Our community deserves a leader who's going to advocate tirelessly for us, just as Kay Khan did over the last three decades. Yeah, we need someone with a fresh perspective who's ready to challenge the stagnant status quo and will strive to bring about real change. If elected, that is exactly the leader I aim to be. Our community and the state as a whole is facing numerous challenges, including budget gaps, housing shortages, lack of investment in our education system, insufficient action on climate change, and so much more. As your next state representative, I would bring innovative solutions and ready to introduce measures that can address these issues head on. My professional background provides a strong foundation for effective governance. I know how to balance budget, eliminate waste, and ensure that every dollar spent benefits our community. Furthermore, transparency, accountability, and direct engagement with constituents will be the cornerstone of my approach. State government processes have been concealed for too long, and I firmly believe that to serve those who elect us effectively, you must prioritize openness and accountability. Your voices deserve to be heard. Your concerns should shape our politics. Voters have a clear choice in this election. I believe it's time to move beyond the politics of the past, embrace a future where our government works for everyone. If you believe that too, then I hope I can count on your support on Tuesday, September 3rd. Together, we can shake up the system and deliver more than just the status quo. Thank you everyone for being able to join us today, as well as those on YouTube later. Thank you both very much. And you both came in with 10 seconds to spare. Great discipline. Appreciate it. So, uh, yeah, and really appreciate your time and your thoughtfulness and your willingness to serve. It means so much to have good candidates and to have a competitive race. So we appreciate that. Um, a reminder, everybody, this is the Democratic primary on September 3rd. 
one of these two candidates will go on to face Republican opponent, and we look forward to having a conversation with one of you and your Republican opponent uh, before the election in November. So thank you again very much, and thanks to everybody for watching, and to Grassi for sponsoring our, uh, our series that we do with these debates. So thank you. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Thank you.